final lecture of putting the model together, I would say that uh, we need to discuss incremental and fundamental innovation. Um, in a way, it's all the same innovation process. It's going to be the same model now that we've put together. It's going to be about iteration and about those elements. However, we've already mentioned that the longer time period is required for fundamental innovation because we're starting with greatest uncertainty and bringing down the options over time. And obviously, incremental innovation, uh, we're doing this over a much shorter period of time. We're not increasing the probability uh, increasing the uncertainty as much. And so we can um, have incremental innovations faster than we can have fundamental innovation uh, up here in the marketplace. And so here our job is to show you that the model um, can uh, explain both of these extremes and tell you a little bit about the aspects of incremental and fundamental innovation. The first part of incremental and fundamental innovation lecture, we're going to talk about incremental innovation. It's a bit easier to understand, and the current environment worldwide is dominated, and it is always dominated by um, incremental innovation, but um, in particular, um, in the current time period we're in, uh, everybody, the connotation for innovation tends to be incremental. So we're going to dis start a discussion there. So if we're going to define things as, say, incremental or fundamental, we're going to have to figure out how to size up an innovation. And as you know, this is very difficult. People will more or less by intuition argue about, well, this innovation's bigger than that one, or this one's bigger than that one, and blah, blah, blah. So here, we don't have to do that anymore because we have our innovation model. And so now we can just... Uh, carefully think about a particular innovation and what has transpired to get that innovation to the marketplace. And it gives you an idea of how incremental or how fundamental the innovation is. And this will allow us to compare things like the transistor to Apple iPod or to eBay. I think most of you probably have the idea that uh, certainly the transistor is the most fundamental of all these, you would think, right? Because uh, when the transistor was invented, it created a, um, you know, multi-decade growth spurt, uh, which resulted in Apple, iPod, and eBay, of course. But uh, in general, we want to think about this, even though your intuition may be correct, it may be incorrect at times. For example, Apple... Everybody says, wow, it's a really innovative company. But actually, if you use our model, it's a medium scale uh, innovation company. And most of its innovations are not even uh, medium scale. So we'll talk about that in the, in the next lecture, lecture nine. Uh, we'll talk about a few modern innovations. But based on our model, and what you've learned so far in this class, we can actually think about four factors that are going to help us define how incremental or how fundamental a uh, innovation is. For example, how much uncertainty did um, the innovation start off with? Meaning that um, was it pretty obvious that a small change in a technology or a small change into a new market? Is that the only thing that happened and therefore there wasn't much uncertainty? Or was it kind of a big, big, vague thing where the market applications weren't exactly clear uh, and neither were the complete set of technology or research that had to be done to arrive at it? Uh, or did people, you know, completely consider that such uncertainty was so far into the future they would have to think of new ways to produce something. These are all signs of great uncertainty and if history is recorded accurately, which is a big if, then we can determine uh, you know, how fundamental it is. That's just one, um, one metric. However, there are other ones that combined with this will help. Uh, how many elements had higher uncertainty? For example, I just implied all of them might have high uncertainty, but 
uh, they, they don't, and we've been drawing in our model all the circles having the same size, but of course it doesn't have to be. I gave the example previous in this class of TSMC, and there the market application and the technology was fairly constrained. It was kind of more or less was already out there, and the largest uncertainty that was introduced was a new business model. And so that's a very nice, maybe medium scale innovation, and we know that because two of the elements are not changed that much, even though there was a lot of uncertainty introduced into the third element and to arrive at that new business model that TSMC uses. So how many of the elements actually at the start of the thing were, were opened up and allowed to uh, converge on other aspects besides what market application or technology already existed? Of course, another sign of the top two um, is how much iteration did the innovation have to go through in order to converge? Because obviously, if we're doing the innovation process um, in the most optimal way, and it's a fundamental innovation, then the uh, it'll take quite a long time to converge. And we'll talk about that time in the next lecture. And then finally, related to that is um, if there's a lot of iteration, like I was implying in the last bullet, um, of course it takes a long time to go through all that iteration and arrive at a final commercialization. So sort of the number of iterations and how long it takes to go from point A to point Z um, are intimately related and, and two separate additional metrics. And if you put these four together, you should be able to determine how fundamental or, or basic you know, how fundamental or incremental an innovation is. So let's talk about the easier and to understand uh, incremental innovation. And obviously, uh, on those four points, we're going to be talking about things that happen over a relatively short period of time, not much iteration, and we're not changing many, many elements at once. So for example, uh, only a slight increase in uncertainty is created. And what I've drawn here is the case where, well, let's consider a few new technologies that have appeared or that we'd like to, to perform research on. But we're going to keep the business model that we're doing, say, in the enterprise, and we're going to keep the application the same. So uh, obviously, I mentioned this before, running enterprises typically large companies that have been running for a while will do this sort of thing because they have market dominance in a particular application. They have a business model that's been accepted by all the other players they interact with. Remember the supply chain and customers and everything, other businesses. And so a lot of times they'll be searching for, wow, if I could just have a slightly different technology that when I plug it in, and when I say plug it in, using our model, it's starting off with those three uh, little purple circles like I have here and you know uh, increasing uncertainty by opening this up a little bit and that's what I mean by plugging in and because then uh, uh, it'll take a few um, iterations and then we should be converging so uh, again with those four points that we bring up only one element has been changed the time that it takes is very short so if I you know, note here, the time is relatively short and the number, the number of iterations, it's supposed to be a number sign, the number of iterations uh, has been relatively small because I've only opened it up a, a certain amount. So this is very, very typical for, like I said, a company that's already released previous versions of a product. Um, technology is a typical one and also you can have the inverse case where you keep the technology the same, but you just try to find a slightly different market application area. That's actually hard for a large corporation because all of their sales folks are generally aligned to a particular market application segment. And so in a large company, they'll try to even keep this one and they prefer to find that magical technology bullet that's going to allow them to yet release another product after incremental time horizon, which could be, say, one to, to three years. So let's talk about some examples of that. Uh, once the microprocessor 
and the PC revolution had occurred, uh, the um, uh, different incremental steps between the microprocessors uh, were incremental innovations. Now they're not the incremental of the incremental, meaning that you know these are still you know uh, important jumps and require a lot of work and research. However, um, you know the sequence, knowing uh, that a lot of the uncertainty in market application and implementation is done, meaning that the business models, the relationships in the industry, who gets what in the supply chain, you know, all that stuff doesn't change. What does change is that um, Intel in this series um, changes things in the technology slightly, looking at more technology options in order to progress from one to the next. Um, and if you were to look uh, the same thing happens in the wafer sizes. Uh, when you're, um, those of you not familiar with uh, semiconductor technology, uh, what happens is that um, at earlier in time, when the volumes were less and the industry had not scaled that much, the industry had relatively small wafers. Today, the industry is at larger wafers with larger equipment and larger plants, and there's some few players probably still trying to go to 450 but the you know this is mature these days so it's not clear how many people actually do that but during a long period of time like 40 years this thing or 30 years from 100 probably uh, this thing has uh, increased over time and again it's because um, pro uh, uh, products like the microprocessor force the uh, economics to change and so um, when you reach a huge volume instead of building plants with lots of equipment, uh, the idea is you can go to fewer pieces of equipment, much larger wafers, and because you get more integrated circuits from a larger wafer, then you know your infrastructure and everything scales differently. And so it's pretty obvious when you want to make the economic transition from one to the other. So again, um, here not technology oriented, well it's partly technology, there's some technology you know related to this, but it's also economically, so it's implementation, right? So basically, you kind of shift the way that you're doing the manufacturing. Uh, and the original Amazon, what I mean by that is that um, if you think about the original Amazon, even though there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, um, in reality, uh, the original, and the keyword here is original, uh, is essentially just taking uh, something that already exists. The application of selling books was exactly the same. And uh, the um, I mean, book technology, you know, is exactly the same. They didn't change printing or anything like that. What they did change was implementation, where they moved, you know, to an online business model. Uh, in some sense, you know, you could look at this as a technology change or an implementation. This is one of those gray areas because if I Think about it. Um, all, all that changed was even the business model is still the same. I'm selling essentially um, a book to a consumer, and so you could argue, well, implementation didn't change that much. It's really just the technology because you know I'm just doing it through a computer. But if you look more carefully, I would argue that uh, the business model is different, right? The idea was in the first Amazon that uh, they weren't going to have the same kind of huge distribution that say a Walmart did and that they would just be connecting people differently and that it would be a different uh, business model and that's actually how they grew because they convinced investors it was a different business model it turns out today they look a lot like Walmart except that they implemented technology online to connect the customer to the products and so you know today you might argue it's uh, it, it, you know, in hindsight, uh, you could argue it's, um, you know, he, it wasn't really that much of a different business model and it was just a technology shift. Now, of course, when I say the original, it's because today Amazon, uh, like Google, has ventured into creating uncertainty in several different product areas from moving into uh, the market application of storing people's um, information on the web, you know, doing web services. Uh, as well as um, creating uncertainty in device and um, 
implementation at the same time with the Kindle, right? Change of business model and uh, technology at the same time. So, so I think that uh, that's why the keyword is original. So those are some examples of um, incremental innovation. Not the last stuff I just talked about, which is the new Amazon. The, those are more than incremental. And we'll stop there, and now we'll, we'll contrast that in the next, next lecture with fundamental innovation.